Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's conversation and webinar. I'm Susan Thornton, the CEO of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. And we are delighted today to have Professor Julia Skarsbrek with us from the UK. And um, But before we get started, we're going to be talking about milestones across cutaneous lymphoma research, and particularly the Prospective Cutaneous Lymphoma International Prognostic Indicator, or we refer to it as ProClippy. But before we get into that, um, I would like to just take a moment to do a few housekeeping things. If you have, have questions with regards to um, the topic that we're discussing, you can feel free to put them into the Q&A uh, on the Zoom window. So, and we'll have some time, I hope, at the end to answer some questions. And then I'd also like to um, thank our sponsors for the program today. Without their help, we wouldn't be able to do the program. So thanks to everyone who's been able to support what we're doing here today. And as I mentioned, with us is Professor Julia Skarsbrek. And before I bring her on, I'm going to read her, uh, her bio. So Professor Skarsbrek leads the cutaneous lymphoma service in the Rare Disease Center at the University of Hospital of Birmingham in, in the UK, not Birmingham in Michigan, which is where the foundation is headquartered. Um, and she's the honorary professor at the Institute of Immunology and Immunology at the University, the chair of the EORTC Cutaneous Lymphoma Task Force and Decreases Society. Dr. Skarsbrek is active in both clinical and molecular research fields for cutaneous lymphoma. She has a successful translational research program and is involved in the development and delivery of both commercial and academic clinical studies. She's published over 100 peer-reviewed articles, contributed to a number of books, and is involved in the development of clinical guidelines. So, um, it's really wonderful to have Professor Skarsbrek with us today, and welcome to our discussion. It's really an honor. Thank you. And thanks for, uh, you know, I was going to say kicking off your Friday evening with us, but I know you've got clinic after this. So thanks for yes. squeezing <laughs> us in between, which is um, absolutely amazing. So um, I thought we would start by framing up the context a little bit before we dive into the details around the ProClippy study and kind of set the stage because uh, I think a lot of patients may have heard some of these acronyms. I know we talk a lot in acronyms and things like that, but I uh, wanted to kind of give some history and background. And so I thought we would start with a little bit about the International Society for Cutaneous Lymphomas or as many may have heard of it, the ISCL, which is the nonprofit professional clinical society that was founded and formed way back in 1992. And when you think about that, it, it really wasn't that long ago. Um, and I think about it in the context of my disease experience. I was diagnosed in 1991. And so this professional society didn't even exist then. And my at the time, who was uh, my specialist that I worked with for 15 years, Dr. Eric von der Heide, was one of the founders of the International Society. And, and you know, from what I understand, the history was uh, a group of cutaneous lymphoma specialists, small group, was at a World Congress in Dermatology. They had dinner and they came together and said, hey, you know, we really need to find a way to be able to share clinically what we see, experiences with the disease so that we can better support and um, help our patients develop new therapies and all those kinds of things. So I wanted to set the stage because I think that really, in some ways, was the beginning of the infrastructure that enabled the um, Cutaneous Lymphoma International Consortium to come about. And I'll just go over this real quick. And then Professor Skarsbrek, I'll let you jump in and kind of give your perspective because you've been so deeply involved in the consortium and having, having come together and um, where that all came from. So 
Uh, we call it, you know, the acronym is the CLIC. So it's the Cutaneous Lymphoma International Consortium. And it really is a global collaboration of clinicians, researchers who are working diligently in the field of cutaneous lymphomas to share data, to collect data, to be able to inform care, therapies, um, and to try to learn a lot more about cutaneous lymphomas. Given that it's such a rare disease, we really need to capture a lot of data across a wide geography. So I'm going to stop there and let Dr. Skarsbrek jump <clears throat> in because Thanks, the primary, you know, contributors to get the click started. And so maybe I'll let you kind of talk a little bit about wherever you want to go, the ISCL, the click, kind of how this all came about, why it was so important and kind of where you started. I, I think, yeah. Exactly. So a lot of our thanks goes back to Eric Vonderheide, um, who really was one of the founders of the ICL. Um, but since this time, um, uh, we have a very strong group of skin lymphoma experts around the world, and they're all interested in improving patient outcomes, which is sort of our uh, main emphasis of the group. So we look towards um, clinical trials, towards looking at treatment responses, and really looking how, how can we improve things for our patients. So the group is uh, for the ICL is international. We have um, specialists from all continents, from Asia, North America, South America, Europe, um, who all work hard together. We, we meet up at meetings and we have um, also have virtual meetings. So literally just before this one, I've been on with the board members of the ISCL discussing our strategy for the next year. So the ISCL has uh, internal meetings, but it also has external meetings and presentations. We accept um, research from uh, collaborators, and we have a, a two yearly, one, one yearly in person, and one yearly virtual meeting where we present data, we look at other people's results, we discuss those, and how they can really help the uh, CTCL or, or cutaneous lymphoma population. And through that, we develop CLIC which is more the research aspect. So I see a, the ISCL is looking at the clinical aspects, whereas CLIC is developing studies where we can hopefully look towards improving treatment, treatment outcomes for our patients. And the biggest um, study we have going at the moment is an observational study. So that's where we collect data on patients and we share that data and we use that data to try and work out um, <clears throat> uh, how to improve um, outcomes. So ProClippy is the Prospective Cutaneous Lymphoma International um, Prognostic Index Study. So we're looking at trying to work out which are the factors that can help us determine which patients may have a rocky or more aggressive clinical course and help them early on in their disease to stop that progressing and which patients actually are going to do pretty well on their own and actually probably as physicians we need to stand back a little because a lot of skin lymphoma is very low grade and actually just not do too much and let let the patient's own immunity look after the disease. I've probably talked enough, Susan. <laughs> Do you want to cut in with any well, questions? I, yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go back a, like a little bit and just say that the ISCL and the professional societies have always been open to those of us from the foundation. And we also attend the meetings and hear the science and listen to what being just tried to do our part in providing some travel awards to young researchers who are presenting at the different meetings, which I think is really important because as we know, 
it's a rare disease. There aren't, I mean, there's, I was, I'm always amazed at the last, uh, well, in-person meeting when, when everyone was together in Barcelona in two years at the World Congress, there were over 400 participants, which to me in a rare disease says a lot about the commitment of the clinical and research community to this particular patient population. And, um, you know, and I always borrow Dr. John Zick's line. He said somewhere along the way, you know, at one of our patient programs, there's someone in a lab, a researcher somewhere in the world whose lights on and they are working on cutaneous lymphoma. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing of all you who work so hard to and are de dedicated to kind of peeling the onion on this complicated and rare disease. Um, and there's so much to learn and there's so much that we don't know. And without the facilities or the capacities to be able to pull data together, real data that you can analyze and share and look at and come across trends and so forth, uh, and leverage technology to do that, you know, you really come up with methodologies to determine whose disease may progress, whose may not progress. And I think that's one of the big questions in the patient community beyond, you know, how did I get this disease in the first place, which I don't know if we'll ever really be able to answer that, maybe. Um, but, you know, once I have this disease, how can I know in working with my specialist whether my disease is going to be on that end of, of, you know, kind of that slow, not really aggressive, or is my disease going to progress? How am I going to know? When, what are the triggers for that? To, what should we be looking for? What kind of tests should I be taking? And, and it's hard to answer without having the data over the long course of time from a very wide and deep field of patient information. So I, I think that's why it's so exciting, A, that the click came together, and that was no small endeavor. You know, it sounds easy, but, you know, really, you started when, in 2014 or 15? Yeah, really... that was the Vancouver meeting um, for the uh, ISCL was when we all got together. Yeah, and it's you've got technology behind it. You've got to find databases. How do you store the data? How do you collect the data across multiple institutions? That's no easy feat. And then I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, another component is not only the data collection, but the biobank part because everybody stores patient specimens, you know, all our biopsies and our blood work and so forth it, it, in different ways. And you need that kind of data out to be able to inform mm. the clinical studies and, and the trends. So you, you have data and then you have specimens. So as also part of the click is sort of this additional project beside the data study part, the research study part is how do we capture around the globe those bio specimens in a way that can then be included and studied and you're looking at apples to apples right so that's no small i did i think um anyway so all that to say um this is an amazing adventure to get from almost a blank sheet of paper to where the click is today. And I, and I, you probably know this off the top of your head, uh, 30 or 50 institutions. Um, yeah, so um, it really is a great collaboration. So we have over 50 sites from 20 countries crossing six continents. So it really is a global effort. And um, we have already in Proclippi um, 2,000, nearly 2,200 patients who have signed up. And I can say for my institute, none of the patients I've approached have ever declined it um, because I think ultimately everyone wants to help each other. And this is a study about helping each other. It's about working out 
what we can do to make the patient um, journey better um, and not only in outcome but also in quality of life so we capture alongside data on blood and skin and lymph nodes and um, what treatment but we also um, collect quality of life data and how that patient's feeling in the three main domains so you're the emotional domain the symptom domain and the functional domain so this really helps us understand it's all very well having a treatment that's fantastic and causes the skin to clear but if it makes the patient feel really lousy then that's not a great treatment so um, we're really pleased that we collect that sort of data because I think it gives you some real um, real meaning to how good a drug is and how good a therapy is. Saying that, um, if I walk you through a little bit of the, uh, the data, we've got say 2,200 patients. Um, that includes around about um, 1,500 early stage patients and 700 advanced. So it's a range of, of uh, different stages of disease. Uh, we collect blood data on our patients. So um, what's been quite interesting is we know that there must be some skin lymphoma cells in the blood for it to be at different body sites. It has to travel somewhere so that it can be at different body sites. But we haven't found the blood involvement to be particularly important in the early stage patients. So um, that's interesting. So in the advanced stage patients, it is significant. There's a disease called Cesare that some of you will be familiar with, where they have a very high amount of um, abnormal cells in the blood. And that has um, uh, a, mu a much more um, aggressive course than the early stage. So when, you're, when you've got a lot of cells in your blood, it's important. But when there's a few, it's probably not so important. And then we look at um, some of the skin data and certainly with some of the new treatments, which are antibody based. So um, you may have heard of brentuximab. These are, these are treatments directed against C30 cells. So we can look in our databases, see who's got this particular type of cell and then select the most appropriate treatment. And another recent drug that's come out is mogaluzumab, um, which is very good for sensory cells and uh, that's against CCR4. And again, you can go to the database, you can see which patients express that and, and which patients may benefit most from the treatment. Um, all of the treatment data is collected. Um, and as I say, alongside that with the quality of life, so we can know has that patient had a good improvement in the skin, blood, lymph nodes, and are they also feeling better in themselves? So it really is a very useful tool. We've already been able to look at the early stage patients and see who are the ones that are most likely to progress to advanced disease. And we have picked out several factors. So if you present and you're older, then you're more likely to get more advanced disease than those that present when they're younger. And that may be due to your own immune system. And Susan was saying, you know, what can you do to help yourself? Well, we know that a lot of keeping skin lymphoma in check is a healthy immune system. So, you know, a good diet, plenty of sleep, not too much stress, you know, all the things that we sort of all strive for, but probably fail badly on, um, actually could, could go a lot towards keeping your disease in the early stages. And then some more um, academic uh, things. So um, when we look at the type of cells, if we see larger cells, that can be a warning signal in the early stages. If we see the cells tracking down the hair follicles, follicular tropic disease, again, that can be a, a warning signal. Um, and if there's lymph node enlargement, um, that again can also be a warning signal. Even if those lymph nodes aren't involved with lymphoma, that can point us towards those patients that might need slightly more um, intensive therapy early on. Um, in the advanced stages, actually, so far, the biggest sort of trump to, to things going wrong is, are, is big lymph nodes. And actually, that's really um, such, a, such a sort of uh, signal for things that might be going 
uh, faster or more in a more aggressive way that that's really helped us um, shape our treatment because we know in the advanced stages that if a patient has a aggressive course then a bone marrow transplant is something that we can do um, which can actually ultimately result in a cure and a longer um, lifetime for that patient. So we can now select out patients earlier on and say, hang on a minute, this patient um, has got this and this, and we might be a bit worried about them. Let's have a chat to them about a transplant, see if they're eligible, see if they've got a uh, possible donor. And um, maybe that's the best way we can, we can give them a long and healthy life. Oh, I can't hear you, Susan. I don't know whether it's just me. Oh, here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Always technical challenges. Um, but I, you know, a lot of questions swirling in my mind, and I, I'm. It's so exciting. The idea of capturing all of this data, and especially as you were mentioning the new therapies that have come out, and being able to over the long term capture how people do on different therapies, what might some of those either markers or disease presentation show that point to or, or more, maybe it's not even earlier, but maybe it's a little more personalized treatment pathways based on learnings over the course of time, particularly with some of the new therapies where you know, you've got great clinical trial data, but that data is very um, narrow in focus because of the way clinical trials must be conducted. So <clears throat> once these new therapies are available commercially, hopefully around the globe, another topic of conversation, but we won't go there today. Uh, but, you know, looking at that longer term effectiveness and how to utilize these therapies in combination or one after the other or prepare for stem cell. I think one of the challenges is, you know, stem cell transplants, A, are not free and are still a high risk therapy. And even though quote unquote curative, some people still end up with residual disease and then there's graft versus host. So there's a lot of things that come into play. However, if we, based on the data from the clinical perspective, you can narrow down the focus for a particular patient earlier, I, based on what I have heard and what you're saying is, we can begin to look at other alternatives for treatment sooner, which may give the patient a better shot versus you know, kind of running through all the different therapies, um, impacting the immune system when you really need a strong immune system to kind of go through some of these things. So what, um, yeah, there's like so many things that I, I want to ask. Um, <laughs> I guess one of them is so far in, as you're capturing all of this data, what have some of the changes perhaps in treatment or approaches that the clinical community has taken on now that we've got some data to say, um, you know, should we be doing more baseline blood involvement across the board for all patients, just because that seems to be maybe a monitor if things change in the blood over time, you know, so are, have there been some clinical um, collaborative decisions in management, I guess, using this new data? Because we didn't have access to this kind of information before. Yeah, so absolutely. In, in, in the real world. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that that's one of the most important things about observational studies as opposed to clinical trials is it's real world. Because a patient, if a patient 
isn't tolerating a treatment, doesn't want a treatment, they stop it. In a clinical trial, you really want to try and keep your patients on the trial because otherwise you don't get the data on efficacy. So the big push when a patient's in a clinical trial is to make sure they stay on the treatment. When you're doing real world treatments, if a patient doesn't like the treatment and it's making them feel lousy, you stop it. So you can really change the data when you look at real world compared to clinical trials. And certainly we see that. We see that often you're using treatments less frequently or less cycles or you have pauses that you don't see when they're having a clinical trial because it's so regimented to how you give it. Um, uh, with the blood, it's a very exciting era because we can now look at very low level blood involvement. So uh, test called PCR, which can just look at real sort of single cell um, involvement in the blood, right up to um, a sort of a leukemic blood picture. And we can track those patients and we can see when they change and when they may, may need different treatments. And we know we've got better treatments for blood now. So we have always had some good skin treatments, either skin directed, you know, from phototherapy to total skin where they have electron beam therapy on their skin. Um, but now we have some really good blood treatments um, like mogluzumab or ECP, which has been around a bit longer. Um, and so we can tailor our treatments according to what the patient needs. And that's so important. Um, in our disease, because although we call ourselves skin lymphoma, actually it involves skin, it can involve blood, lymph nodes, and also sometimes um, other organs like the liver or the central nervous system, the brain. So we sort of tend to have this big umbrella term of skin lymphoma, but I'm sure from the people listening will appreciate that there's a massive, massive spectrum of disease. Some patients may have one or two skin lesions, other patients may you know, be covered head to toe. And the needs and the treatment options for those patients are very different. So um, what observational studies allow us to do, they allow us to um, group patients and say, okay, for patients who've mainly got one or two skin lesions, what's best for them? Or for patients who've got a lot of large tumours, you know, what's best for them? So I think that's very important um, that we don't just put everyone in the same group, but we actually look at individuals or groups of individuals who have similar uh, disease status so that we can help them the best way. Now, I think that hopefully for everyone that's listening or who watches later is very comforting because the patients that we talk to at the time, I think that's one of the questions is, you know, how do I know that this is the right therapy? How do I know if this is going to work? How do, you know, and up to really more recent years, a lot of it was a lot of art and science, but you know, you really, which is why it's imperative to see an expert in the field, someone that has seen a wide variety of iterations of the disease. But the, the line has always been, you know, you see one patient, you see one patient. There, it's very hard in this disease, it's so complicated to do that kind of, um, I won't say prediction, but looking at timelines with other cancers, it, it, at least in a lay, from a lay person perspective, you know, you, you've been diagnosed with this particular cancer, here's the traditional therapy, here's what we can expect, here's what you can expect, and if you make it through this. But in cutaneous lymphomas, there's such a broad spectrum, and we haven't had great data or capacity, as you were saying, with the new um, TCR being able to look at blood involvement at a very small molecular level to do that kind of personalized, really truly personalized based on that individual's iteration of this disease at that point in time is so important being really managed. And again, I think to your point of maybe changing a therapy sooner than we normally would, you know, before it starts to show up 
in the skin, if we've got, this can help inform perhaps other diagnostics or ways of, of managing someone's disease over the course of time, because now you've got things you can look for or look at maybe even before you see the manifestation on the skin, especially for those that have more challenging and, and aggressive disease. Are, are you looking at those kinds of, of things? I know we don't have a ton of diagnostics yet really in cutaneous lymphoma, but I would think this would help inform some of those as well. Yeah, we're always looking at better ways to get a diagnosis. We know that um, the similarities between conditions like eczema and psoriasis mean that many of our patients get the wrong treatments early on. And whilst many of those aren't detrimental to the course of the disease, they are detrimental to that patient's well-being because it's frustrating when you're given treatments that don't work, when your doctor doesn't understand what's wrong with you, when you know, you know, in your heart of hearts that something's not right, and you be told, you take this cream, go away, it's fine, you know, don't worry about it. So often, you know, when we make the diagnosis, that is um, helpful to the patient because we can then give them the right information and, and get them on the course of uh, the right treatments. So we're looking at better diagnostic techniques. Um, certainly uh, there's a technique called high throughput sequencing, which is a new technique. And I think it's going to provide a much better way of teasing out those patients with skin lymphoma against those that have got eczema or psoriasis. Uh, the data is not there yet, but I'm pretty hopeful that it will be. But at the moment, we rely on clinical, so what the patient has on their skin, pathological, so that's when you take a biopsy, what you see down the microscope, immunohistochemical, which is when you um, uh, tag markers onto the cells uh, on the biopsy to see what the cell markers are what numbers they hold, and that gives you clues. Um, and then finally, the PCR test, which is the very sensitive test, looking for cells which are coming all from a single cell of origin, which is the hallmark of any malignancy, any cancer, is those cells all originate from one cell, and that cell multiplies. So we then look at all of those things together to help the patient get a diagnosis um, but if we could produce a singular test through high throughput sequencing, then that would be a lot easier. So we could just do one test, a bit like a COVID lateral flow <laughs> antigen test and say, yep, that patient's got skin lymphoma. That would be something that would be very meaningful for our patients. Well, wow, yeah, that's almost like the holy grail, right? To have some kind of a standardized <clears throat> diagnostic so you could tease out the difference between psoriasis or eczema and cutaneous lymphoma and i know you know you mentioned generally speaking um especially on early stage disease if someone is diagnosed with psoriasis or eczema because cutaneous lymphoma can be hard to diagnose even in the best scenarios because uh, it's challenging in early stage isn't detrimentally to the treatments, but I know with some of the new biologics that are coming out for treating psoriasis that are really great and eczema, we're starting to see some challenges for those people that have been misdiagnosed as having psoriasis or eczema that go on those kinds of therapies because they, they impact a different part of the immune system than the cutaneous lymphoma. So really we have to keep an eye on that, which then creates more of, I think, an a, a immediate challenge to being able to, to differentiate between, particularly in, in early stage, so that people <clears throat> don't go on a treatment that may have an adverse yeah, a detrimental. I mean, I spend yeah. a lot of my time um, lecturing on exactly this, Susan, because, you know, I say, you know, time and time again, I see patients who've been mismanaged and 
there are warning signs you know there are warning signs if a patient isn't responding to treatment that normally works for psoriasis or or eczema think is it psoriasis or eczema or have i have i missed something and this is you know often the physicians don't think of skin lymphoma um and there are certain treatments which are detrimental so cyclosporin has always been one of the older favorites but certainly the new biologics can worsen skin lymphoma so i don't think you know biologics are expensive um and uh, have a high adverse events i don't think it's unreasonable to do a biopsy if you're going to put a patient on it if they've got a disease that's not responding to the typical eczema psoriasis treatments why not do a biopsy before you put them on something which could be detrimental if that wasn't their diagnosis so i'm a big advocate in um just thinking when something doesn't work and when you're reaching for those third line agents have you got the diagnosis right or are you missing something and sadly i see a lot of patients who've been misdiagnosed and had the wrong treatments um and i also see patients who've sort of done the other way that they've got a low-grade lymphoma and they've ended up in a haematologist's office having very aggressive treatment when actually they don't need it so you know all the time we're just trying to educate people about skin lymphoma you know think about it if you're worried about it do a biopsy if you're worried about the biopsy refer to one of the specialist centers you know it, it's much safer to check and if it if it if it turns out to be wrong then th there's no harm the patient can then go on that treatment course yeah and I, I think what you're what you're accomplishing with the proclippy study you know this is an ongoing continuing to capture that data the more data that can be amassed analyzed and presented as you know here are the things you want to look for can help all of us educate the clinical community, you know, that may not be specializing in cutaneous lymphoma. I know we've talked to physicians, you know, or patients that say, my, my physician had never seen a case. They saw it in a textbook when they were in their dermatology residency, you know, because it's rare and you can't expect someone who's dealing with all different kinds of skin conditions to know everyone all of them to the greatest detail um, so i think educating the patient community as well it's hard to educate the general public because it's a rare disease but if you are have been diagnosed or even if you're in that window we talk to a lot of people who well they're not sure the biopsy has come back maybe inconclusive but the kinds of questions that they should be asking of their clinicians uh, with regards to making sure you're doing the biopsy, are you sending it to the right, to the right pathology um, centers that have the right kinds of testing and know what they're looking for, you know, or go for a second opinion to a specialty center. You know, I think that's one of our recommendations always if people can, it's not always possible, but you know, if you're able to get that second opinion even if you have early stage i think there's something around peace of mind and uh, having an expert say yep i i agree it's early stage and you're probably going to be fine that's the right course of treatment and then if something changes right you've got a backup and you you can go to the expert center and um, kind of take it from there so I, I just really applaud your efforts in pulling together this broad brush of data because otherwise I think it becomes even challenging to help educate a broader community because you can't really tell them what should you be looking for? When do you kind of make that clinical determination to go look for, for, for a skin lymphoma versus psoriasis or eczema? Or, you know, I think on the flip side, as you mentioned, you know, if, if a patient has a little more aggressive disease and you've got lymph nodes that are expanded, does that really mean that they have really aggressive skin lymphoma or is that more of a result of the, the 
the body trying to impact and work on the disease. And, and I only raise that because I know that was, was my experience when I was in, you know, really bad shape tumor stage, but I was being seen by an expert in the field. My lymph nodes were everywhere ridiculously enlarged, but I didn't have, that was, and that was back in the late nineties. So we didn't have all these newer tests, but I had expertise and they did a needle biopsy and then they, they actually took out one of the lymph nodes and there just wasn't, you know, the, the mycosis fungoides in my case was not evident. So it was really enlarged lymph nodes because I had so much skin involvement, right? But if you're at a, at a hematologist who's used to looking at your standard B cell lymphoma with enlarged lymph nodes, and you don't know that this could be a little different, you know, that's a challenge too on the other side, as you mentioned. Yeah. So having more data to educate both sides of the fence, right? Because this is such yeah. a narrow, <clears throat> narrow, rare, but it, it impacts people's quality of life. And I think the other piece that you're capturing with the quality of life data is so critical because as we all know, this is not a one and done, right? You don't, you don't get diagnosed, get your treatment. And then if it works, you're good. See you later. Bye. We'll come back in a year for, you know, your scan and your checkup. This is chronic need to manage sometimes more uh, aggressively than others, but quality of life, can you access the treatment? What are the impacts on your daily, your daily life? The itching, of course, is always a huge thing. How do we impact that? How do, how do we help mitigate kind of that time from starting a new treatment to when we know that it may take weeks or months really to begin to see an effect? So how do you mitigate that in, in process and manage the itch and help people stay on treatment and not get frustrated and, you know, all those things. So all that data is so critical to capture over the course of time and disease iteration, which I think can then help the patients digest it in their own head. You know, here's my experience and the clinicians can help to guide and direct and support and say, yes, that's what we've seen. That may not be you, but in general, this is what we see and this is what you can expect and anticipate. So I, I really applaud you looking at the whole, the whole okay. picture, not just, you know, the clinical side and, um, and I know we're coming up on our, our time and I want to make sure that I know, I think we had a question or two, Dr. Scarsbrook, is there anything else you'd like to share? Maybe just, um, what do you, what's your vision? What are you excited about through the data that you're seeing in Proclippy? What do you think the future holds for as we learn more and gather more data? Um, I think what's really exciting is being able to see which treatments make most of an impact. Um, so I'll just finish off by saying, you know, we use something called time to next treatment to assess how good a treatment is. So the way you do that is if you go on treatment, you then look from that day one of that treatment starting, when do you need your next treatment? And the longer that is till you need your next treatment, regardless of how long you had that treatment for, actually shows that treatment works. And it not only works, but it's tolerated. So um, probably very exciting data that's coming up now is time to next treatment. We think that's really important because it not only encompasses how efficient a drug is, but also how tolerable it is for that patient. And, um, it's clinical benefit for that patient. So it's really exciting to be able to look at drugs now and say, okay, time to next treatment for this is this, and this is this. And if you use it in this way, you can make it a better treatment. So I think we're being to find tools that we can utilize to improve patient outcomes. 
um, by um, learning from from past experience, which is which is obviously very good for our patients. Yeah, that's very exciting because I know even for early stage patients who may be on light therapy, for example, you know, there's always questions around. Well, I'm pretty clear. Should I? should I take a break? Do I ramp it back? Do I, you know, what are all those questions? And by collecting that kind of data, we can begin to even just put a framework to say, this is a guideline, right? Of when you might want to think about tapering or, or taking a break exactly. if, if you're exactly. on a stem. Exactly. Because we can like compare that. Exactly, we can we can compare the time to the next treatment for those that have had eight weeks of treatment versus those that have had six months of treatment. And if time to next treatment is yeah. the same after eight weeks to six months, then you could say, well, actually don't have six months of treatment because you're gonna increase your risk of skin aging and skin cancers. So just have the eight weeks because actually the, 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 the length of time it'll work will be the same. So yes, we can definitely guide um, patients to, to better treatment outcomes. And wow, that's adverse, really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, again, I just think about how far, how far we've come in a very short window of time when you really put it into context. You know, when you think about how this disease was managed pre, say, 2000, 2005, but I think the acceleration of tools, technology, collaboration, capturing that data has really enabled the clinical and research community to take a huge leap forward for all of us. And I think the, the future is very exciting. And as we're looking at some of these new therapies, I'm guessing also that one of the, the outcomes of capturing this data is being able to target maybe some new new areas that haven't been thought of yet for therapies or combinations of therapies that may be in existence to to help manage mitigate you know the more we learn and, and personalize treatments for for patients for the for everyone's for their greater good so that's wonderful so exciting so exciting um, I know we had, as there was a question, Mike, if you want to put it up, I'll, I'll try to kind of put it into the context. Um, and I think, you know, when you're talking about the prognostic indicator, I think this is good. So you're learning about through the data, what kinds of prognostic indicators may point to more aggressive disease or more challenging disease earlier. So when do you have a tool or is that in maybe in process? And if so, when would you use that? Would you use it at initial diagnosis or how do you yeah. use that along the course? I think that's a great question. Yeah, so that, that's exactly when we use it at initial diagnosis. And then we're beginning to look also now as we're getting more data about uh, where do you get disease progression, what that means. But certainly the main index is at diagnosis. And for patients presenting with advanced stages, we already have something quite workable that we published um, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology 2015. And we've just tested it on our ProClippy cohort we had created that from our older, not older in age, but older in when they presented patients and looked at that, what we call retrospectively. So we went back and looked at our records. We produced this index, um, which was published. And now when we've looked at the ProClippy data, that index still works. It still holds out. And that index looked at advanced patients um, and found that if you had an older age, if you had these large cells when you were diagnosed um, in your biopsies, um, if you had stage four disease, so um, either blood involvement or nodal involvement, um, and if you had a raised uh, level in your blood of uh, a marker called LDH, which stands for lactate dehydrogenase, all of those things were indicators that you may have a more aggressive course and maybe we need to step in a bit earlier on with some treatment to improve things so um yes 
we have some things which are ready to go and we have other things which need more work, more time, more effort, um, fine tuning them so they become usable indices that um, can really help our patients. Wow, that's great. And, and do you have any recommendations for patients who are, may have an opportunity to inspire their clinicians to participate in, yes, absolutely. in the click? And, and, you know, if they're not participating, they should be. And we can absolutely. help get the absolutely. word out, right? We need, we need to, yeah, we need to be learning continuously. And the way we learn is from our patients and from what happens to our patients in a rare disease. That's absolutely essential. All right. So everybody out there, if you're talking to your physicians, you know, just let them know that they need to be a part of the click and sending their data and uh, should be a member of the ISCL or uh, so they can participate. And then that way you get to participate and share your data, which then helps all of us. Um, so I think we had one more question and then I'm going to let you go. Oh, can patients participate in Proclipi? Through their um, physicians, yes, through their right? Physicians. So that's... So, mm -hmm. Yeah, you need you yeah. need to get your, your doctor to sign up and then um, the patients can um, <clears throat> can participate and uh, we make our data available to our patients as well so that you get to have a look how things are. So yeah, that's that's it's great. All about and, and all you Yeah. And we so everybody who's listening, ask your physicians if they're participating and encourage them to uh, reach out and jump on the bandwagon because the more data we have, the better off we're all gonna be all the way around. So, well, with that, Professor Skarsbrek, thank you. Thank you for, for joining us, for sharing your brilliance, your wisdom. And I am um, so grateful for your passion, for patients, for research, for quality of life, um, and being able to pull all those pieces together. It's it's just such a an honor to have you with us. and. Um, Thanks for sharing about Proclippy and the click and what we're doing and uh, letting us let the patient community understand a little better about what's happening and um, on all our behalfs. So yeah. Thanks, with Susan. that, pleasure. yeah, it's a pleasure. Have a great weekend and uh, can't believe you're still going to be seeing patients at seven o'clock at night. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. And thank you. You know, everybody for joining us. It's really been a pleasure and have a great weekend, everybody. Rest of your Friday um, and we'll see you all soon. So take good care. Stay well. Thanks, Susan.